Hello everyone, today we're jumping in the time machine once again, we're going back to 1998, and we're looking at the Europe vs. Americas tournament, and this game is between Grandmaster Maurice Ashley, who was 2500 at the time, with the white pieces, and with the black pieces, English Grandmaster Julian M. Hodgson, who was 2575 at the time. Um, the game started out with the modern defense, E4, G6, very flexible, um, opening, many transpositions from this position, D4, Bishop G7, Knight C3, C6, H3, D5, there's your strike in the center, Maurice decides to uh, close the center. F6. E takes F6. E takes F6. Bishop D3. Knight H6. So we see some unorthodox play from Julian uh, Hodgson here. But his position is not uh, terrible. Knight G E2. Castle. Castle. And as a matter of fact, we can say that he's equalized out of the opening. So perhaps his surprise has worked. All right. Uh, because uh, Maurice has played it quite um, close to the vest. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, sometimes when the opponent uh, plays an unorthodox system, um, many times uh, people will fall into the trap of trying to refute, you know, their so-called, uh, you know, incorrect play and wind up using a lot of time on the clock you know searching for the absolute best moves and uh, many times they go wrong you know there's like a saying that I used to hear a lot uh, playing blitz um, chess that goes uh, something to the effect of think long think wrong and sometimes you can just uh, overthink uh, positions and sometimes when players uh, choose unorthodox continuations you know, that's exactly what they're trying to do is get you to overthink, um, you know, a position and then you wind up losing a lot of time and making incorrect moves. So Maurice has played very solid here and as a result, black has equalized, but it's better sometimes to have a solid position. And then maybe you can uh, look at the, you know, more precise continuation uh, later on. So knight d7. Knight f4 from Maurice, bringing the knight up the board, of course, threatening the uh, fork here at e6. So the rook comes to e8. The other knight drops back. And now f5. c4. Knight f6 here. And now we see c takes d5 and, and c takes d5 here. Knight, knight d5 is possible, but then uh, white can bring pressure on this b3 to a g8 diagonal. And queen b3, say knight f7, and then knight takes and c takes. Bishop e3 and b6, and you can see there's a lot of pressure here from white on the black queen side in the isolated pawn all right so black opts to just take on the isolated pawn immediately and here's where i want to begin uh, the analysis so as you can see once again we have this uh, relatively um, symmetrical position isolated pawn for each side Three pawns on the king side, two pawns on the queen side. Um, and I wanted to use this game, uh, not just to show Maurice Ashley the game, um, but to continue on our theme of how to uh, deal with uh, symmetrical positions and um, also positions where there's not uh, a big tactical uh, move that, you know, you know to decide the game all right this is where your planning and analysis 
uh, has to come in. So I've been doing a seven step analysis in my videos um, that you can use and I'll do it uh, right here. And you'll be amazed how effective it is in finding a plan uh, in these type of positions. So first I look at the king safety, of course. Uh, this is a wash. Both kings are relatively safe. Uh, if you want, you can make a note that the uh, F pawn is removed. You know, um, you'll see this in a lot of Dutch systems, but the F pawn is uh, pushed forward uh, for the black king. But for the most part, the kings are safe. Are there any threats? And when I say threats, I mean direct threats. So, for example, it's white to move. If this pawn was here, for instance, this would be a direct threat. Because if white doesn't move, he would lose his knight. So it's not a threat in uh, two moves, but a threat uh, if it was uh, black's move in this case. So there's no direct threats. Material, right? We just count up the pawns, count up the pieces, right? We don't assign any values, right? So that's um, pretty much self-explanatory. Material is equal. And we look at the open files. So we start entering into the positional elements. We see that the C and E files are, are open. Right? Again, we don't want to assess the value of those files or who can take over them or anything. We just, we're just acknowledging that they're there. All right? And along with the files, we want to also um, acknowledge diagonals and such. So, for instance, the A3 to F8 diagonal is open. Again, for future reference, C1 diagonal is a good diagonal. It's open also, right? Save the knight on F4. C1 to H6 diagonal. Now we move on to the uh, pawns uh, structure. Pawn structure is um, uh, pretty, pretty symmetrical, except uh, black has this Dutch defense type setup here. But you have three pawns, um, uh, three pawn islands rather. Uh, for each side, uh, the thing, the feature that stands out about the pawns is each side does have an isolated pawn. Okay, so if we were assessing this, we would have to say that, uh, the pawn structure is equal because each side, you know, has the same uh, pawn structure pretty much. Okay, but the feature that stands out the most is the isolated pawn for each side. Another uh, more subtle feature that you always need to acknowledge is what color do the majority of the pawns stand on okay notice here that since white has adopted uh, excuse me black has uh, transposed into this kind of dutch uh slash stonewall type setup with his pawns that all of his pawns except one are all on the white squares okay this is something that you want to acknowledge okay that's a big factor so you check that off um, now step two on part five, remember if you look at my other videos, um, steps five, six, and seven are all two step, uh, uh, two steps. So five B would be your weak and uh, strong square. So again, we're looking uh, from the white side. So the strong squares for white here would be um, C5, E5. And I like to include B5 here. And what do I mean by strong squares to get specific? Um, and also uh, E6. Uh, w uh, what do I mean exactly? Okay, pardon me. Let me get that phone real quick. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, so now, um, where were we here? Um... Let's see, so we had, uh, we talked about the uh, pawn structure already, and we were talking about the weak and strong squares. Okay, so what exactly do I mean by um, strong squares here? I'm talking about specifically, coming from White's perspective here now, um, the squares that are in enemy uh, uh, territory uh, right now that would be strong for White. In other words, these are squares that Black cannot use in his own territory. Right. For example, this rook cannot safely move to the E6 square. OK, now what's let's go back for the super new people. Black's territory. Right. If we look at this imaginary line, I'll take this knight, for instance, this imaginary line here. Right. This is like the borderline between ranks four and five. So this is the borderline. 
okay all of the squares from rank uh, ranks five through eight this is considered blacks territory and conversely ranks one through four all of the squares in here are considered whites territory all right so strong squares for white are squares in blacks territory that black uh, is not able able to use all right and that white can use or he can uh, that he can use himself or he can prevent black from using so for example white cannot jump into e6 because he would get captured however he has enough control over that square where he can prevent black from using the same square okay so black cannot put a rook here he can put this bishop here okay a lesser value piece okay so this square this square is strong a, a good a square for white okay now it's not as strong as say for instance e5 because white can actually occupy this square safely without being captured in black in black's territory so this is the strongest situation for white where he can actually occupy a square in the enemy territory safely okay so that's the difference between these squares right which are very strong squares and more or less having influence in the territory so here yes this bishop can come here but the rook can't come here but you still want to count these squares this is a strong square for white because again black is not able you know for instance to move his rook there right he can he can't occupy e5 either so we count those squares same with this square b5 if say if b5 were played white could just capture with his bishop his bishop okay has influence on this square all right so those those are things that you want to keep in mind when looking at weak and strong squares and if a square is uh, strong for one side then correspondingly it's going to be weak uh, for the other the other side all right so squares c5 e5 b5 and e6 are good for white and correspondingly not so good uh, or weak for black all right and this goes into the strategy uh, later on when we start uh, thinking about a plan all right on the other side of the board notice how white cannot occupy c4 safely or e4 right or g4 for that matter it's good for black okay and correspondingly weak for white we go to step six again the two-part process who controls the center that's equal and space is equal also right so that's a wash seven again two step process development okay i mean this a wash but if you want to get super technical we can say that black has a very uh slight lead here uh in development if you want to count the rook on e8 right give him that extra you know extra step but that's pretty much equal there's no big lead in development here second is the mobility of the pieces or quality of the pieces or piece location whatever you want to call 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 that all right because development is important but it's more than development right you want the pieces to be on good squares and good location all right so what i like to do is i look at every piece right and go down the line and again you can break this down however you want but eventually you just look at the board and you know you'll see it quickly but just for demonstration purposes so for instance you look at the queens right the queens are still on the original squares all right um you look at the rooks the a the rooks are still on a1 and a8 respectively but we see that black has a rook on the e file and remember we had showed that this e file was open earlier in step four of our analysis okay so there we will give the nod to black as far as um his the piece location in other words this rook on e8 is better than this rook on f1 at this moment and we can go down to the bishops Whose bishops are better? Well, we have this bishop on at home still on c1. This bishop is still at home on c8. 
and then we had this bishop here on uh, g7 and this bishop on d3 okay now again slight advantage here but i will give the advantage uh, um, as far as the uh, placement of the bishops to white here why is that the reason why is because remember we spoke about the pawn structure earlier all of these pawns being on white squares this bishop is is a bad bishop right now and doesn't have too many prospects even if this were open this bishop couldn't get out to a6 safely because of the control that this bishop has here all right so it's gonna it's gonna take some um you know some movement from white to to uh excuse me from black to get this bishop in the game all right this bishop here on g7 is pretty powerful of course this knight will have to be moved and then the scope of this bishop of course increases uh greatly this bishop here on d3 is kind of biting on granite here but at least um again this bishop is more in an attacking situation because all of the, oh, excuse me all of these pawns are on light squares um, furthermore, this bishop can always move, right? Remember, we control the square b5 in black's territory. So this bishop can always, you know, move if uh, it's having trouble getting through this uh, granite uh, setup over here on the king side. Finally, well, we look at the knights. Who's knight, whose knights are better? All right, again, this is, this is you know, it's pretty close. But I will have to give the the uh, nod to, to white here. The reason why is because, again, this old adage, knight on the rim is dim, right? This knight is not uh, looking too good. And this knight on e2 is not looking too good. But I would take this knight on e2 over this knight uh, here on h6, okay? Even though it's, a, you know, it's pretty close. And then I would take this knight on f4 over this knight on f6. Oh, those knight on f6 is excellent too. This knight on f4 is a little bit further up the board and attacking more um, uh, objects in black's territory. Okay, this knight is more of an attacking piece than this knight at this point. All right, so now that we've done our analysis, what's the conclusion, right? Remember, we're looking to find, after the analysis, we want to determine if we are better, worse, or equal in this position. So if we're white, we're going to say the position is um, it's pre it's pretty much equal here, okay? Um, I mean, if we're going to give an advantage, white will have the slightest of advantages, okay? But I think for practical purposes... Um, yeah, we'll, we'll give white like a, a, a slight, slightest of advantages. So uh, the point I'm getting, of course, is not not anything that, you know, it's not a type of position where you're going to be sacrificing pieces. All right. It's not a, a position where you can, um, you know, uh, you know, wink at your friends and tell them that you'll be, you know, you'll be done in, the, in you know, in a few moves. All right. But so we'll give we'll give uh, a slight advantage uh, to white here. Now that we know that we're slightly better, you know, what what kind of plan can we um, put together? Now, the plan is always going to be based on the features in the position, which we discussed earlier. All right. Remember, we talked about the open files. We talked about the, you know, the mobility of the pieces. And the plan is basically going to going to consist of uh, getting rid of our, our weaknesses. Right. Um which means that we're going to counteract the strong points in our opponent's position and and also we want to um you know uh attack uh all all of uh i think i said that already attack the opponent's weaknesses right basically attack where we're strong focus where we're strong and mitigate our own weaknesses right and then the opponent's going to be trying to do the same thing all right so now we're going to uh, get specific. So what does this mean? Well, we want we know there's open files. We want to occupy and dominate the open files. So which means e file, the c file, right? We want to get our bishops right to good diagonals. So that means finish completing our development, right? We still have bishop home on c1. Okay. Um, We acknowledge that our isolated pawn is weak, so we want to make sure that is protected. 
okay? And conversely, right, our opponent's isolated pawn is weak also, so we would like to build up an attack on that, all right? So you're going to have a battle here where, you know, of course, white wants to attack his opponent's isolated pawn. Black's going to want to attack this isolated pawn also, right? This segues into uh, symmetrical positions. Symmetrical positions, it's important to gain the initiative, okay? Because you're basically going for the same goals in a position for the most part when it's symmetrical, all right? So, therefore, it's kind of like whoever has the drop on the other opponent is most likely uh, to get an advantage uh, in the position, Okay, so now we're going to move on in the position. So basically, what, you know, what moves specifically should happen here? Well, based on the weaknesses, the main weakness in the position is this isolated pawn, like speaking from White's perspective. So ideas that come to mind for me, moves like knight c3, putting more, putting more pressure on the pawn, um, queen b3 also, right? I put putting pressure on this pawn. Moves like bishop to e3 or bishop uh, d2, right? To get this uh, bishop in the game, followed uh, by rook uh, to c1. Okay, if I'm if I'm playing with the white pieces, those are the type of uh, moves you know that uh, come to mind. If you're on the black side. Again, we talked about a major weakness being this uh, bishop being blocked in. Is you definitely want to get this bishop free, whether it's somehow trading this bishop off, getting this bishop out of the pawn chain, perhaps bishop d7, and you know somehow with queen b6, whereby you're attacking this uh, isolated pawn, and then you can also get this bishop out to b5 and trade it off uh, somehow to be good. You definitely want to utilize your strong squares. So, like moves like knight e4. You know, some cases, you know, you have to get the knight, a knight over here. But definitely want to utilize these strong uh, squares. Right? And notice how you're util utilizing the square. And then you're also uncovering the bishop um, to attack on um, d4. Okay? Um so that that's more or less black strategy again he has transposed into some type of like dutch setup so usually you want to advance these pawns on the king side and attack the um the uh what the black king um so that's basically going to be some of the ideas that transpire in the game the moves aren't going to be exact but now that you know the general uh, plan in the position then you'll see uh, these players' ideas, um, you know, more clearly. So after C takes D5 was played, Maurice played H4. So now some of you are like, wait a minute, what happened? You know, that's not in the plan. That's not. So actually, it is because he doesn't want to get the this knight kicked off here. So for instance, Knight C3, G5. Now actually. This is a this this works out for white, and I, the best move in the position is knight c3. But after g5, knight here, knight takes and queen takes with this threat. Come in here with the bishop, and white gets an initiative here. Knight f7, for example, and then h4, and then you could keep it keep attacking the uh, the weakened uh, king side of black. I think Maurice was um, worried about this move G5, and he played H4 to prevent it. So now Knight F7 here. Now again, remember I was saying in the analysis how Black's knight on the rim was dim, how it was you know a little bit misplaced. So notice how Hodgson is improving the knight. Okay. Because when you analyze a position, then you can come up with a kind of to-do list in a position. And, you you know, so he decides, hey, let, let's get this piece straightened out. So a good square for it is to come to E6. And again, you can exploit these squares. Conversely, of course, black, excuse me, white would love to have his pieces 
in these squares too. Maurice here plays bishop c2. Okay. Now, again, I like queen b3 better. Attacking this pawn. Because these type of moves give black a little bit of breathing room. But this is this is how it you know how it is in human chess anyway. So bishop c2, bishop d7. Again, what did I say about the the bishop needing needing to come out? Right? This is a bad bishop. So we see Hodgson completing his development and getting his pieces out. Now knight c3, putting more pressure on d5. Hodgson plays knight e4. Now he could have just played um, bishop c6. Okay, but it's understandable that he might want to make this bishop more than just a glorified uh, pawn here. Play could continue bishop b3, putting more pressure here. And then black could play b5. And try to get this knight out of here. Instead, he played knight e4. Uh, for those of you who don't know about Julian Hodgson, he was a very tactical uh, player. And um, I can see why he wouldn't play a move like bishop uh, c6. Okay, he's more uh, in the line of, uh, you know, Tal and like Alakon in his style of play. The more dynamic, Okay. So he didn't overlook this pawn on d5. All right. He wants black to take it. Instead, Maurice just simply plays h5. Simply threatening to capture on g6. And then after h takes g6, knight takes g6. If knight c takes d5... Then bishop c6, and now now that bishop is alive, right? So for the price of a pawn here, that bishop comes alive on c6. Okay, this is the dynamic um, play that I was talking about. And eventually, black is going to get that pawn back. He plays move queen, because remember this pawn is hanging, so he just plays queen takes h4 here. And then this isolated pawn will be weak. So this is what I mean uh, when I say he plays on the line of, you know, like Tal and Alakon because he's not concerned that he's a material down as long as his pieces are active, right? Because he knows that the activity will result in the, the uh, return of the material at some point, okay? He wasn't the type of player to really, um, you know, try to hold on to material. If knight f takes d5... Then simply knight takes c3, b takes c3, bishop b5. And again, there's what we spoke about earlier, the bishop getting out of the the, uh, the pawn chain. Again, coinciding, everything coincides with the analysis. Bishop takes f1. And of course, this position is equal in spite of um, black giving up the exchange, or white giving up the exchange, excuse me. Anyway, Maurice decided to avoid taking that pawn and he played h5 <clears throat> now julian decides to exchange knights knight takes c3 b takes c3 so we have a, a change in pawn structure here okay and now g5 again hodgson is not really concerned about this pawn Right, because he figures that he will get dynamic play. So if the knight takes d5, he plays bishop b5. Attacking the rook and attacking the knight here. Maurice drops the knight back to e3. And now he's attacking this um, pawn here. f4 is played. Bishop takes f1 is possible, of course. Queen takes f1. Rook c8, bishop b2, protecting the c3 pawn, f4, and knight g4. And um, white uh, is, is definitely better here. Those two bishops are very strong. White has his pass pawn in the middle of the board, protected passer. And black does not have the best um, uh, pawns on the king's side. And this king is quite vulnerable. 
okay in this position these pawns are been fixed and blockaded and um this is not you know that that it's um black does not have full compensation um even though he's up in exchange okay for uh in this position okay those two bishops the weakness around the black king the protected pass pawn in the middle of the board uh to me give uh white a very nice position there so in my opinion it was right for him not to take uh on f1 so f4 is played attacking the knight knight just simply hops forward at five and now bishop e2 attacking the queen and the rook queen d2 and here Hodgson decides to restore the um, material equality here uh, he could have again taken exchange but he probably assessed the position as I did uh, just a minute ago figuring that the uh, that white had too much compensation in this position even though he would get the exchange this is just a sample line here again you see the bishops kind of running wild in the, in the position and then you see the pawns uh, begin uh, to advance here and then again this is just a, a sample line here as the position opens up those bishops get uh, stronger and stronger and then when you add that past d pawn uh, combined with the weakness around the king the black king that is um, position becomes very uh, sharp for black as you notice all those pieces are surrounding the black king because there's no pawns to protect the king so the pieces kind of have to stay home and watch so Hodgson avoids that and decides to just grab this pawn knight takes g7 so Maurice grabs the bishop pair king takes g7 and c4 so we see a simple idea here um of course the position is has changed now and the position is becoming sharper um again the same idea now the the pawns are now being advanced in the center right if we wanted to we could stop and do a, a, a another analysis here as the position has changed but it's pretty simple to see that white having this bishop here or it's pretty simple to see that the main themes here now are no longer just positional in nature that we start seeing some tactical themes here first of all white having the two bishops the general weakness of the uh kings remember one of our first uh steps in our analysis is looking at king safety now when you look at king safety it's clear to see that white has a big advantage in king safety all right and that means your focus should start shifting it wherever your biggest advantage or strength is that's where your focus starts to shift you can see in this position that the black king is just denuded basically um this is one of the this is like a, a dutch defense going wrong right the black bishop is gone the pawns are advanced in front of the king and the diagonals are just open and white has the two bishops okay so you have the two bishops then you have this pass pawn situation and so Maurice is just simply advancing the pawn. He wants to open up the lines for the bishop. This is human human chess. All right. Um, Hodgson, the only thing he can do is pretty much go go for broke. Um, and this is what he does. What do, what are you normally doing in Dutch defense? You try to attack on the king's side. So this is what he's doing, right? He's trying to make this into a brawl, right? You had those boxing matches, this boxer versus puncher or whatever like that. And the um, guy's getting out boxed. And so the other guy just tries to make it in a wrestling match, a brawl, right? He's fouling, he's fighting dirty. This is what Hodgson is going to try to do is just muddy up, muddy up the position. And then, you know, maybe he can land a knockout blow. F3. Maurice plays d5, opening up the bishop. Bishop b2 could have been played also. Remember, there's no pawns to protect the black king, so he has to use pieces to protect the king. This is dangerous looking, right? Of course. Right now, bishop b2 can't be played, but wow. 
This is a dangerous setup. So bishop d1. And of course, we had these ideas, right? Hodgson plays f takes g2. And now Maurice plays bishop b2 here. No, he didn't hang the rook. He, it wasn't like he overlooked it. He could have played king, king takes g2 here. But after bishop takes d1, rook takes d1. Queen f5. Okay, black is uh, still in the game. Okay, some pieces have been traded off. And white's king is now uh, exposed. Okay. So this is why Maurice simply played bishop b2. Gives up the uh, exchange. King takes f1. And now knight e5, right? What else? Bishop takes h5. And now, critical moment in the game. King h6. Looks like a logical move. Just, you know, get the king off the diagonal, right? You know, get him out of that dangerous uh, pendant situation. And he's attacking the bishop, right? And he figures after bishop takes uh, e8, rook takes e8. Black is helping him bring a piece into the game. Uh, excuse me, white is helping black develop a piece into the game. But here, uh, Hodgson probably Hodgson probably should have just bailed out and played queen at five here. Um, and go for a draw after bishop takes e8. Black can have a perpetual here. And just keep repeating the position. Or if king g1, then just queen g4. And these, this is a draw. After, after the queen f5. Because white's, white's king becomes exposed on the light squares. Though instead he played uh, king h6. And here, bishop takes e8. Rook takes e8, and the difference here is, of course, the knight can't move because of the queen is still pinned, right, as opposed to being on f5, right? Big difference, right? One square difference. But then you have this check. Back to the game, so bishop takes e8, rook takes e8, and now queen e2. Right, so the position is getting pretty dangerous here. Again, another chance for Hodgson to bail out, but he plays g4. Queen f3. And he winds up going into this um, worst endgame. And this is just a sample line. And he could have, he would have been worse, but. You know, he could have tagged on a little longer. But again, I think he'll, he winds up losing this game. This one anyway. This ending. Instead, he played G4. And this allowed a real simple uh, pin. And there's no way now to protect the um, knight. And one of my favorite words that I like to use. The knight is captured in a Ragnar rather ignominious manner right the simple simple uh skewer tactic and pin right overcomes 2575 grandmaster king g4 and just queen g7 check and uh it's got to be mate uh shortly and hodgson had to resign of course he can't capture the queen here because if queen takes and bishop takes with check, king takes and the king is one square away from the rook. And Maurice would win in that manner too. Alright, so good game. Um, Maurice Ashley, who would go on in that tournament to score five points, five and a half points. Uh, Hodgson would only make 50% in that tournament. He would score five. I think the the star of that tournament was Alexander Shabalov, who scored eight out of ten for the American side. Um, I think, yeah, matter of fact, in that tournament, the American team was uh, two Brazilian players. It was uh, the young, um, I think, uh, Rafael Latal was on that team, 
in uh I think it was eighteen. He wasn't Grandmaster yet in uh in uh Giovanni Vescovi was also on the Americas team. Neither one were Grandmasters yet. I think they had just scored norms. Maurice Ashley, of course, wasn't a Grandmaster yet. He would uh I think he would get his Grandmaster title the next year. And uh on the other side you had Alexander Baburin, um Julian Hodgson and I can't remember the uh rest of the players on there. But anyway, closing up this game, um again what we saw okay was uh again how to play in symmetrical uh positions, right? We went over planning and analysis and also um we saw how the the plans worked out for each players, right? Based on the analysis and then we saw the change uh in the position. Okay? So when the position starts changing you know, sometimes you have to reassess the position. So we had got to the position where the king was wide open, for example, and then we saw Maurice switch into attack mode on the king, right? The uh, the um, uh, Hodgson had over advanced, over extended itself on the king side, and then all of a sudden we saw his king exposed, and we saw the pawns uh, running up the center of the boards, the C and D pawns, and then we saw the uh, bishops. Um, being used uh to attack in the position so w when you make a plan um you stick to your plan until it runs you know runs its natural course and then sometimes you settle down in a position and you make a new plan okay so here it's basically white has a slight advantage it's symmetrical you know you're attacking the isolated pawn you're just getting your pieces out and you can see here the attack on the d pawn you see Black doing his thing, right? He occupies the E4 square. You know, they're going back and forth. Little change in the pawn structure here. So White accomplishes one of his goals. Attack, he uh, gets the D pawn. Black accomplishes his goals, right? Remember we talked about the bishop being bad. Okay. We see Black doing his thing, right? Using his... Um, F pawn as a battering ram on White's king side. Just going through it real quick. Securing the bishop here. What does this do? This lowers Black's king safety. All right, and gives an advantage to White. And we see that this becomes a ma major theme. Right now, we're not worried about isolated pawn anymore because, first of all, the uh, Black pawn is gone. And now we have a uh, pass pawn in the center. And black hit, white has taken control over the, uh, complete control over the center in this position, right? And combined with the two bishops and the exposed king, he has every right to uh, start attacking. And like I said, black has no choice but really to uh, just go for broke. We spoke about the e-file earlier. Notice white never really contested the e-file there. And black kept control of it. Until the very end. Which is ironic. And we see the end of the game. With a simple pin. And like I say in my other videos. It doesn't matter how complicated. The, the tactics seem to be. How many layers there are. They always, they always end. With a real simple elementary. Uh, tactic here. And um. If you give, if you give this uh, position, you know, to uh, you know a beginning uh, chess player who has some basic tactical understanding, and say, "Hey, White, the move here," uh, he's gonna find he's gonna find the uh, the uh, winning uh, continuation uh, in this position. So that is it for this video. I hope you know it was enjoyable. I hope you learned a lot. I hope you have a, a you know uh, some of you players are not familiar with. Maurice Ashley actually playing chess. You're used to seeing him, uh, you know, on the uh, St. Louis Chess Club, doing anal at the St. Louis Chess Club doing analysis, and uh, you know, but he actually did play at one time, and he actually, uh, you know, the grandmaster. Actually, he actually is 2,500, and I know a lot of people say, "Oh, well, he's not that strong." This and that. Listen, there's, there's. Hundreds, there's probably a thousand grandmasters in the world right now, 
okay it's just like it's it's like anything else because that kills me when somebody tries to compare one grandmaster to another like they'll be like oh he's not you know an elite grandmaster like 99 percent of these guys are elite grandmasters it's just like the nba right you only have a few elite players you you know you have your your steph curry's of the world your kevin durant's your Kawhi leonard's etc right lebron james right and then it drops down right but guess what an average player in the nba would destroy you on the basketball court right if you if you took the worst player in the nba right now and try to play a one on one right and he played his best like you wouldn't score a point against that guy so a lot of times you it's the same in chess you take you take you take a guy that you you say oh this guy's a weak grandmaster or whatever like that you wouldn't be able to do nothing with that guy, okay? You probably play a hundred hundred blitz games and lose all of those games if he if he wanted to beat you, okay? So I say that that you know that you have to put you know some some respect on 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 the guys and the fact that he earned the title, okay? And um, you know it's very very hard to become to become a grandmaster, okay? Uh, in chess. All right, because we will all be one <laughs> if 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 it was if it was easy. So when we say, "Oh, this guy's not this and that," yeah, there's listen. There's not. There's only one Magnus Carlsen. There's only one Fabiano Caruana, Kasparov, etc. Vasily Ivanchuk, Shirov. Got like you talking about. You talking about all time greats. You, you know, Anand, etc. Like that. You know. So there's tons of GMs out there, but just because they're not the cream of the crop or in the top 100 or whatever don't mean they're very strong players there's international masters that over 2500 right not even, they're not even grand masters but international masters and super strong super strong players so anyway that's enough ranting please like and sub, uh, subscribe to my channel check the links below there will be um a donation um button there um a donation link rather uh, please support my channel and um, also check out the, the products. There's always going to be uh, DVDs or books uh, related to the opening uh, that you saw play today. So in this case, it's the Modern Defense. Enjoy, and I'll see you guys on the next video.